Well, let's pray and we'll, we'll ask for God's blessing upon us as we uh, hear from the word. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you that your word is sharper than any double-edged sword. And we thank you it is a, a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. We would pray that you would give us the grace to navigate it well, uh, to have receptive hearts so that you would use your word to build us up in the knowledge of Christ and that you might fashion our thinking as it comes to the Christian life so that by grace, gospel grace, that we might be those who not only hear the word of God but do it also. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we've heard, Solomon once wrote, for everything there is a season, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to tear, a time to sow, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to keep silent and a time to speak. And even though Jesus said the truth will set you free, when, you're asked, when your wife asks you, babe, uh, do you think I've put on weight? That is not one of those times to speak. That is one of those times to be silent. And here Paul says there's also a time for killing. There's a time to kill. Because the truth is, If you want to grow in grace, if you want to make progress, if you want to be filled with the Spirit rather than grieve Him, then believe me, Paul says there is a time to kill. Look at our verse, verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Here, here, here's Paul, he's saying, put to death whatever belongs to the fleshy nature, to the, to the earthly realm. And then, then what he does, having given the imperative to put to death those things which belong to the flesh, to the old nature, to the old man, he then gives you examples of what he has in mind, what, what, what he calls uh, the sins of desires, the sins of the heart, the unseen things the things that propel us forward into actions and and motivate us. And and it's not that it's an exhaustive list. None of these are exhaustive lists. But they're lists that are meant to prime your pump, get you thinking. And so he lists them, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which he calls idolatrous, idolatry. And what, what he's doing is he's chipping away at the heart issues where pornea, that is sexual immorality, is first entertained. And pornea, or sexual immorality, it, it covers everything. Every, every aspect of immorality, or at least sexual immorality. And what Paul's doing, as uncomfortable as it is for us, in a highly sexualized and immoral culture, he's wading through the swamps of our heart where impurity and lust and evil desires reside. And he's heading into all the dark corners and recesses of the heart, places where we imagine someone other than our spouse or we entertain something other than the marriage bread, or where we justify our thoughts and desires because of our circumstances. You know, my life's hard. My my husband doesn't understand. He's unaffectionate. My wife's too busy. Was he not tactile? And it's in those places, Paul's saying, that you to put to death those things, those desires. Because he says we, we, what happens is we covet, we envy. Because we believe that, that, that others don't deserve certain things, certain people, but we do. Somehow convincing ourselves that God has not been fair. And because what happens is we we cover it in our hearts and we envy in our hearts, we sort of wallow in some sort of spiritual self-pity and then these passions and these desires have a way of gaining momentum. 
And after a while, even adultery, fornication, homosexuality, pedophilia, sexual abuse, pornography, all sorts of immorality, sexual immorality, pornea, start seeming plausible. I can imagine how awkward this is, listening to this, if you're a man or a woman who thirsts after another, who lusts after another, who, who has made it a habit to camp on impurity, to feed on evil desires, to, to almost delight, as it were, in sexual immorality. And Paul calls these things idolatry. That is, anything that's more important to you than God. Anything that would demand your allegiance over your obedience to God. Anything you're willing to break God's moral law for, to have and to possess. Paul says that's an idol. And we live in a culture where freedom and sexual freedom and immorality is an idol. Now, we've seen this before. You've seen it before. I've seen it before as a pastor. Where, 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 where the idolatry of sex or a relationship means that someone's willing to walk away from God, walk away from church in a very public way and say, you know what, if, 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 if it's a choice between God and that man, if it's a choice between uh, God and being stuck in a marriage when I want a divorce, then I'm gone, then I'm walking, then I'm choosing that. Paul says, that's idolatry. Because you imagine, they're imagining that, that they can't live without what they want. They must have it. And so if they have to, they're happy to even walk away from the faith because companionship and intimacy or even just sex is in fact their true love, the true idol, and that commands their true allegiance. And we all know people like that. We've gone to church and worshipped with people like that. Maybe some of us have been people like that. Now, these things are very public. Can't hide them. But actually what Paul is warning against, the more dangerous aspect, in fact, is that it's private and it's hidden. These are fleshy, earthly, sinful desires that are most often hidden from our parents and our elders and our church and our spouses and our, and our friends. Or at least until the emails or the receipts or the web traffic or the, the mobile footprint finally reveals what was hidden behind a veil of idolatry and deceit. Now, some of you, if, if you're caught up in immorality, you will be feeling awkward and tense. But likewise, many of you, the vast majority of you, might be thinking, well, this doesn't apply to me. I'm not tempted by these things. I don't do sexual immorality. But sinful desires applies to you. Covetousness applies to you. Envy applies to you. And so Paul is saying there is a time to kill. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Whatever belongs to the earthly nature that would, that would have you set your heart and your mind on things below instead of Christ and his kingdom above, Paul says, whatever those things are, put them to death. In fact, the term here is a uh, medical term, and it's often used of uh, atrophy, the, the withering or the wasting of something. In other words, Paul is telling you that he doesn't expect this to be an event, a one-off victory, a one-off effort. Just slay pornography today and then that will be fixed for life. Slay lust today and then when you put that to death, it will never trouble you again. No, no, no. He sees this as a battle, as a war of atrophy. 
This is not going to be a one-off event. This is going to be a season of killing, a season where you put to death certain desires, a season where you do not feed them, where you do not nurse them, where you do not nourish them. And by atrophy, they are weakened and finally put to death. But you've, you, you, you've, got to, you've got to refuse to feed them. You've got to refuse to entertain them. And rather, you entertain and you feed the spirit. And you starve the things below, but you feed and you nourish and you feast upon the things above. It's like that well-known old story, you know, the old Cherokee who, who's teaching his grandson about life. And he says, son, in each of us reside two warring wolves. One is evil, one is good. And then, of course, the, the grandson says, but, but, but which one wins? And the old man replies, whichever one you feed. Paul says, do not feed the things of the flesh. Put to death through atrophy what is earthly in you. Cause it to wither away because you don't feed it and you don't pay it attention. And then he gives you the reason or, an, or a motive why you should do this. Verse 6. Why? Because on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Because on account of these, God is angry at our sin. God is angry at immorality. God is angry at pornea. God is angry at men and women and boys and girls that use each other and who break God's commandments. And while culture minimizes such things, normalizes them, celebrates them even, uh, Paul is saying on account of such things, on account of such things, a day of judgment is appointed, a day of wrath where sin is shamed and, and evil is no longer excused. So for today, this is the season to kill, a season for killing. And whereas previously he speaks of sinful desires, now the text pivots to sexual behaviours. And while there's no clear and fast line and break between them there's this clear delineation one focuses what's happening in the heart that produces pornea or sexual immorality this covetousness these desires this lust this impurity but from verses 7 onwards it, it, he then focuses on on different ways that it fleshes out he says in these you too once walked when you were living in them but now you must put them all away. Not just some of them, but all of them. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which has been renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is all and in all. Here's what he's saying. You know, he, he's saying, you know what? There was a day you too walked in these sins. There was a day that you too walked according to your, uh, your, your nature, your sinful nature, to the flesh, where you were once slaves to that nature, slaves to pride and anger and money and success and pleasure and popularity and, and, and ungratefulness and entertainment and distraction. That You were a slave to these things, to sin. And you walked in them because that's your nature. It's not because of TV, it's not because of Xbox, it's not because of politics, it's not because of our culture, it's not because of peer pressure, it's not because of poor education, it's because of our sinful nature. We do and we live and we desire according to our nature. And the Bible says that we were all born with a sinful one, a bit like how you know a bird doesn't doesn't have to be taught how to build a nest or how to keep her eggs warm. Her nature simply tells her how to do it. 
or a baby doesn't have to be taught how to be selfish and demanding and to cry out when it's hungry and demand to be fed. It just comes naturally according to the nature. And Paul is saying that by birth, our nature causes us to be slaves to sin. And he says, in these sins, you too once walked when you were living in them. And he describes this as your old self. That's your old self with its old practices. Or he's going to change the metaphor a bit later on. This old self with your old clothes. And he's saying, but now take them off. Take off the old clothes. Take off the old ways. Put off the old man. Put off anger and malice and slander and lies. All these practices of the old man, of the old self. Put them away. Take them off. The Greek word there is, is literally used for taking off your clothes, taking off old clothes. You know how you might come if you, if you were a builder and you're working on a work site and you come in in your dirty clothes and as you come into your nice, neat house, especially if it's a nice, neat, new house, your wife would say, take off those dirty boots. Take off those dirty pans. Well, maybe not if the kids are there, but you get the idea. But take off your dirty clothes. Take off your work clothes, which are stained. Paul is saying that you are a new creation. and Therefore, wear the new clothing fashioned by the Saviour. And it's conjuring up an image where sinful practices and behaviours are taken off and they're literally discarded like dirty clothes, kill the sinful desires, put away the sinful practices and then put on the new practices of faith and love. And then Paul, it's sort of, at first it seems a bit, bit weird. He then starts talking about um, how you've been renewed in the image of his creator. Fair enough, that makes sense. But then he says, which is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, you know, black nor white. He's thinking, what, what, what's, what's that got to do with it? What, why is he talking about this? Why is he making mention that in the Creator there is this unity of believers who are all committed to walking in faith and love? And, and the point of doing that is he's saying, because you know why? Because you know what sin does? Sin separates. Lies deceive, anger isolates, wrath causes others to retreat, slander, obscene talk offends, it intimidates, it divides. And Paul is saying, put away all such behavior because they actually deny the gospel. Because Christ died not just to reconcile us with the Father, but to reconcile us with each other. Therefore, we don't lie to one another. We don't slander one another. We don't envy one another. We don't steal and cover one another's property or wives or husbands or girlfriends or boyfriends. And Paul is saying, therefore, because we have been renewed in the image of our Creator and because there is a oneness and unity in the Gospel as the Church of God, let us not Walk in the old ways that divide and isolate and separate us. And so he says, now is a time to kill. Now is a season for killing. Don't make peace with sin, which actually wages war against your soul. Don't, don't make peace with the old practices of the old self. Because if you are going to seek the things above and not the things below, if you are going to have the mind of Christ, if, if you're going to actually seek and pursue the kingdom, then Paul says it's a time to kill. This life, this life, from the moment you were born again until the moment the Lord calls you home, is a season for killing. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Put away 
the things of the flesh. And that's why I said to you last week that you have to move from spiritual passivity to spiritual activity. You have to put to death the things of the flesh that hold you back and weigh you down and grieve the spirit and mar your witness and sour your relationships. Because the truth is, if you want to grow in grace, if you want to, if you want to make progress, if you want to be filled with the spirit, then this is the time to kill. Because if you don't kill those sinful desires, they will kill your witness. They will kill your joy in the Lord. Speak to your spouse. Speak with family or friends. Ask yourself. Get honest with God. What sinful desires are within me that I need to kill? What sinful practices, envy or, or, or anger or obscene talk or lying, deceit, what, what, what practices do you need to to put away practices of the old self. If you're going to commit to a season where you actually take your sanctification seriously, you can't make peace with sinful desires and sinful actions. What you need to do is you, you need to pursue righteousness. You have to learn how to respond to evil with love, how to turn the other cheek, where provocation is actually met with forbearance, where you will actually commit yourself to overlooking insult and offence and annoyance, where you get serious about dealing with envy, anger, malice, lust, coveting, and in particular coveting. Because coveting is perhaps the most dangerous because it takes on so many respectable forms. And it needs to be said, so I'm going to say it. If, if sexual immorality is an issue for you, then you need to put it away today. Put away adultery, fornication, homosexuality, pedophilia, sexual abuse, pornography and any other sort of immorality that either is practiced or is nurtured and nourished in the heart. Because you need to kill those idolatrous desires that actually fuel the practices. Because Paul says there's a time to kill Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And make today the first day of the killing season. And if you haven't already got it, Paul is calling you to extreme action, to radical action. It's a bit like Jesus says, you know what? If your eye causes you to sin, what should you do? Pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, what should you do? You cut it off. He's talking about a, a drastic action because he says, is it not better to enter into the kingdom of heaven with one eye or one hand than to perish? There's a bloke in the States, a, a corn farmer. His name is Samson Parker. And in November 2007, he was trying to clear a trapped corn stalk in his harvester. And somehow as he's trying to do that, the, the, the glove on his hand gets caught in, in the harvester and his hand starts getting dragged in to the header. And he, he managed to grab a metal pole and he jams it into the header. And he goes about with a knife, a pen knife, I, I believe. He starts cutting off his fingers so he can get himself out. But then a spark from the jammed header sets light to the stubble beneath the harvester and the harvester catches on fire. He says, 
at that point, I could literally start to feel my skin melt away. And I knew I had to do something or I would die. So I got my knife and I just started hacking at my wrist. And when he cut all the way through the flesh, he said that he literally dropped to the ground so he could break off the bone. He had no other options because unless he took radical action, he would have been burned alive that day. Apparently told that when he was finally released from hospital, Parker returned back to the farm and even though he took radical action to save his life, he was quoted as saying that I decided to keep the harvester and to make peace with it. Well, listen to me, don't make peace with sin. Take the radical action. Because if you don't kill the sinful desires that that result in sinful practices, then they will kill your witness and joy. Make today the first day of the killing season. Let's pray. Our eternal Father, we thank you that you have blessed us in your Son with the gospel, that you have blessed us with redemption, that you have blessed us with your Spirit who dwells within us so that we can fight a good fight and that we can take off the things of the flesh and put away the practices, the old clothes of the old man and then put on the new practices of those of Christ as we are renewed in his image and likeness. Give us the grace, gospel grace, to make today the first day of the killing season that you would give us that grace and we would purpose in our heart both young and old married and unmarried, to live godly lives and to start dealing with the swamps in our hearts so that we might put to death through atrophy, not feeding those sinful desires of lust and envy and coveting that result in immorality and sin. But we need your help. We need your grace. We need you to sanctify us through your word and help us and aid us by your spirit that we might be set free. Do it now. Give us that grace. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.